Thanks for checking out another cast from Teal Town, USA. This time around, we speak with San Jose Sharks co-presidents Jonathan Becker and John Totora, discuss the latest improvements to the SAP Center, happy hour promotions, new season ticketing options, updates to Solar for America Ice, working with Fanatics, the upcoming NHL All-Star Game, and more. Welcome to another interrogation, I mean, uh, conversation here on Teal Town USA. Today we're speaking with Jonathan Becker and John Totora from the Sharks, and let's get into new additions to the in-game experience this season. Uh, one of the first things we all saw was the upgraded LED lighting, which gives you the opportunity, of course, to uh, kick from dark to light much faster than it used to be. We all remember that kind of slow orange hue that would happen, but it did seem like it took a few uh, a few games in the preseason to get it dialed in. I saw a few people going, you know, if you're going to a game this season, bring your sunglasses, but now it seems to be really dialed in and it does look uh, a lot better on TV. How has it been, what has the feedback been since you guys have dialed it in and have you noticed differences in your presentation now that you with what you're able to do well aj first thank you for being here again and interviewing us glad to be part of your podcast uh it's always a pleasure and we appreciate your support of what we're doing here at sap center and your support of the sharks so thank you very much second of all we are we are looking for a sunglass corporate partner (laughs) 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 brought to you by ray Ban. (laughs) all kidding aside um uh we needed to uh, improve our lighting uh, while our lighting historically had been consistent with NHL standards, there was another level uh, to, to get to. Uh, the NHL and all sports leagues are about content and creating content. And good lighting creates good content uh, on television, uh, for photography, for the in-arena experience as well. And uh, we had uh, the original lighting here from 1993 when the arena was first built. And uh, the lighting technology has obviously changed, changed a lot. Uh, we were somewhat limited in what we could do with uh, with our prior lighting. In other words, you couldn't just turn on and off the lighting uh, quickly. It had to warm up. That impacted our game presentation, or at least impacted what we could do with our game presentation. So all of that was was a precursor of, of hey, we need to make an upgrade here. And uh, we spent a million dollars over the summer. Again, we, we, uh, we thank our owner, Hasso Plotner, for providing us the resources to provide a first-class fan experience. And one of the things we did was improve the lighting with a with million dollars. And we wanted to be able to, to showcase the arena, showcase the game, showcase our players more effectively on TV, do more with our game presentation. And overall, it's been well-received. Uh, much like the players have to adjust to things during the preseason, we had to adjust as well. Uh, the, the lighting was very bright initially. We made some adjustments, and we hear very few complaints now. Uh, the positives far outweigh the negatives, and it gets us now probably in the top 10 of the league in terms of, of lighting in the arena, and that says something for an arena that, uh, that was built in 1993. We did not do this alone. Uh, we surveyed other NBA, NHL arenas to see what they're doing with their lighting. Uh, the league has lighting consultants that worked with us on this, so we weren't operating uh, in a silo or on an island by ourselves. We were doing our research on this, trying to find out what works best uh, throughout the league, and um, we use the experts in the field to help us. Have you noticed your PG&E bill has gone down at all? <laughs> Not really. No. <laughs> Not really, but we also have, have, uh, we have been using Bloom Energy yeah. for the last seven or eight years. Uh, they are a fuel cell company here based in the Bay Area. I would say they were a startup a few years ago. We were one of the first companies to use Bloom Energy uh, to save on our, our uh, electric bill, both here at the SAP Center and at Solar for America ICE. Uh, we renewed with them. They have gone public within the last six months, and that partnership uh, saved us on an electric bill uh, going as far back as 2011, saves us money each year. Uh, their new technology will save us even more money going forward, plus there are, there are federal uh, fuel credits that we get as well. So in that aspect, we save money, which, of course, powers the lighting in, in the arena. Note to self, invest in blue energy. So, AJ, <laughs> I know that a lot of people who listen to your show are longtime fans, and so for them, the difference in lighting might be obvious. But if you're relatively new to the building, you may be wondering what you're actually talking about because this just seems like lighting. So maybe... For those that remember when we unveiled the stealth jerseys with Eric Carlson, he came in under the darkness, right? Stealth. You knew that somebody was there, but you couldn't tell who was actually there until the moment that we hit the spotlight and the bright lights. 
that kind of presentation was almost impossible to do before the new lighting went in. And that kind of in-game where you see parts of the building are light, parts are dark, they're different colors, et cetera. As a new fan, you might go, oh, I get it, that's part of the presentation. That was almost impossible to do until this summer upgrade. Hmm. Well, besides replacing lighting, I did notice a few games ago, a rather large couple of bins on Autumn Street filled with old seats, it looked like. And uh, I will say that the first couple of games that I went to, I said, I don't know where these seats are being replaced because I don't feel a difference whatsoever. And the last three games that I've come to, all of a sudden it's like, oh, I found the good ones. <laughs> so much more comfy. Is that the first time these have been replaced since the building opened? No. Oh, no. Okay. Uh, first of all, we have to prohibit you from walking behind the arena from now on. <laughs> <laughs> no, they're on the side of Autumn yeah, Street. <laughs> Understood. But uh, we have a systematic schedule to replace seats and things related to seats like cup holders and the like. Uh, so there's an ongoing replacement uh, expense, if you will, uh, going on uh, throughout the history of the arena. So it's not like the entire arena is being replaced or the seating is being replaced in, in one summer. Uh, in order to spread the cost around of replacing the seats, we spread it over the course of a period of time, much like the Golden Gate Bridge. Once you start painting it, yeah. then you have to, st and you're finished, you have to start painting it again, right? It's the same idea with the seats and, and the amenities related to the seats. So I'm glad you have a, a, a new cushion. I'm yeah. glad you're enjoying it. And uh, we do spend uh, uh, quite a bit of a time and attention on, on making sure the sitting experience is where it needs to be. Awesome. Uh uh, small request to fans because the seats are new we'd appreciate it if you didn't stand and jump up and down on them sometimes <laughs> it's funny that people say my seat's broken and we say well how to get broken it's like well i was standing on it to crawl to the other roll mm, you know we'll, we'll don't lean forward on them that ruined them that ruins them faster right no and, and why was i i even tweeted out to the sap center twitter it's like you know um if you're if you're getting rid of the seats i like that as a collector's item if you're trying to but if they're in good shape, we might be able to do them. Some of them, you may or may not want them. Yeah, that's true. Uh, the, the reason we need to replace the seats regularly is hockey fans, they have an etiquette. They know how to use seats, right? But we have many events here, concerts, different types of concerts, right? So there are, there are many different uh, uh, experiences those seats go through with right. the various events we have here. <laughs> <laughs> One of the newer things that we've seen, and we saw a preview of it in September, me and AJ did, was the food and beverage concessions have been revamped with like new places like Conjo, Nick the Greek, uh, Cream, etc. cetera. Uh, plus the, the club level has been revamped. What's been the fan reaction uh, besides me enjoying the helmet nachos, of course? Well, I will say that the helmet nachos are one of the favorite new items on the menu. For those who don't know what the helmet nachos are, not, they are life-size helmet with a San Jose shark sticker on them filled with uh, three layers of nachos, including uh, brisket style beef. I will admit I have a fondness for them as well. Yes. I'm, it's unclear to me that one human being can eat the entire helmet nachos, but probably that means somebody out there is going to try. So I, I encourage you to share. And when you're done, you can put them on your head. Although I would encourage you to clean out the helmet yes. before you put it on the head as well. But I would say the fan uh, feedback has been fantastic. We've gone from, I think people got a little bit tired of the food in the venue. Um, all, it was always pretty good. If you're coming to the arena 40 times a year, or if you come to a couple of concerts, other events, you could be in our building 50 or even 60 times a year. You don't necessarily want to eat the same hamburger every time or the same hot dog. And so one of the things we're trying to do is have a much wider variety of food to appeal to lots of different tastes. Let's be honest. San Jose is kind of a foodie city. There are food trucks everywhere. There's lots of local food. People care about the origin of their food. Some would like it to be organic. Some would be to like it to be more ethnic. So we have a lots more variety than we did before. Even we've reinvented old fashioned. So if you're a uh, uh, somebody that likes uh, a grilled cheese sandwich, we actually have a brisket grilled cheese sandwich that's on what's Texas styles toast, which yeah. is the really tech. So we're doing more. But one of my favorite things I encourage people to do is look for things like test kitchens where we try out new food, uh, and to the extent that you like them. We actually make them stable. Uh, as an example, for many, many years, we've done sliced turkey because people always said they only wanted sliced turkey. And we tried this month, we've been moving to pastrami, wondering because fans said, no, don't get rid of my sliced turkey. And 
pastrami sales are way up. And so we'll start seeing more pastrami food on the menu and not just turkey as well. So it's a bit of an experiment where we're constantly changing the food, uh, also the beverages uh, as well, because frankly, we want to make SAP Center a food destination over time. Awesome. I'm hungry. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you. Um, and this goes back to listening to our fans. We spent a lot of time surveying our fans, and uh, one of the big uh, areas, consistent areas of concern from our fans has been the food and beverage offerings. Uh, so we've t- take, uh, taken many strides to try to improve that. And I want to thank Aramark, our longtime food partner here at the SAP Center, and uh, their new general manager, uh, Brian Toscano, for their efforts uh, in listening to our fans, listening to what we wanted to the experiences we want to create for our fans from a food and beverage standpoint and responding with some creative ideas and those ideas uh, keep on coming so look forward for uh, for more variety as time goes on okay so to follow up on that then we saw the addition this season of say nick the greek conjo scott seafood cream is that something that you plan on going forward in the future with that maybe rotating things like say Armadillo Willie's is not here next year. It's something else or just rotating. I'm just call it, you know, I'm just using them as an example. I'm not, uh, yeah, I'm not putting them on notice. It's actually Willow Glen pizza. Uh, <laughs> we, uh, in general, in general terms, yes. Uh, we asked our mark to go out and, and, uh, talk to consumers not sharks fans but talk to consumers in the marketplace what type of food do they like what do they want what's popular what's not popular and try to incorporate it into the arena and you've seen that with conjo burger you've seen that with nick the greek you've seen that with organic chicken right so all that has worked and we we plan to continue to do that so you're going to see more variety more outside vendors coming in all designed to cater to the needs of the ever-changing um uh, community that we live in yeah you never know what the next big food thing might be Wait for the kale stand to be on the concourse level. Uh, Next home game. Yeah, that's what I figured. Uh, what? And the fan reaction that that would, we're not actually having a kale stand. Yeah, no, 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 no. <laughs> just for since we know you have a lot of literal <laughs> listeners, there's not a kale stand coming. But and and what's been the fan reaction to the? Has it worked well for you guys? Or are the fantastically. Fans? The the so we ask as you heard John say we survey fans actually nightly for feedback and then for extended surveys typically monthly. And food and beverage, quite honestly, has gone from a lower-rated item, lower than we'd like it to be, to one of the top items in the venue. So there's still more work to be done. People ask for even more variety than we have. Uh, fans that not everybody knows if you're a season ticket holder to use your discount card sometimes. So there, there's still more education we need to do. Uh, if you're a social media person, you should follow Shark Tank Eats because we yes. post Instagram and Twitter photos of things that you can engage with. If you've got suggestions, please tag them as well. But but in general, I think we're trending in a really good direction. But I don't want anybody, I, John sort of hinted at this, to think we're done. To us, this is almost a lifelong journey. Food can't be static. It's got to be something we got to change up all the time. Yes. So no matter how good it is at any moment, we think we can get it to be better. There you go. Uh, I want to move over to the beverage side of it. We saw the Sharks in December do a happy hour. Uh, for so, did you guys notice an increase in your booze sales? Um, did you consider a, a also offering a happy hour food option as well, like Calgary has done? Um, and is it a promotion that you plan to do again this season or in the future? So I'll start on this one, and I'm sure John will probably. Get. So in general, I think what we talked about last time I was on, and part of what JT and I are trying to do is create a culture of experimentation around the SAP Center. We want to try out a whole bunch of things see what works and what doesn't work. Uh, When an idea is good, but maybe we execute it in a way that's not perfect, then we'll change that execution again and keep going. So happy hour is a dual thing. One is particularly during winter months when walking from downtown isn't as easy as it is in September and maybe parts of October and then later in March and April, et cetera. People kind of want to park and come to the building earlier, right? So we'll maybe experiment with opening 15 minutes earlier, et cetera. The happy hour concept was a reason to get them in the building as well, rather than going to your favorite watering hole and, and water there, if that's even a phrase. Um, hydrate. Hydrate. Ooh, much better. Thank you for the help. I appreciate that. <laughs> um, it was popular, but not as popular as we expected. Um, we had hoped that it had drive fan behavior to come earlier, because, again, openly, we got a crush of fans that show up right around puck drop, um, I don't know if you probably see it with your own eye test, but we track it systematically. Lots of fans are in the building by puck drop, but not necessarily in their seat by puck drop. And 
um, it's something actually that that even the players notice, right? That people show up like 15 or 20 minutes afterwards. And so we were trying to find ways to get them in. It's not a problem of lines in the building necessarily. Overall, by, in night by night, the lines are typically less than seven minutes to get in the building, which is our SLA. That's our goal to get people in by seven. And so it may be that it, we need a combination of food and beverage. It may be that we need to expand this. But the original test, we're still sort of digging through all the learnings and say, we'll probably do something like that again, but not the way we did it the first time because it didn't work out exactly the way we expected. That makes sense. And I've seen that in the nightclub industry that I've worked in for a long time is you offer the incentive that there's, say, no cover before yeah. 9 o'clock. Exactly. Or, you know, there's some sort of drink rate up until 10 o'clock or whatnot. Uh, the beverage option I thought was great. I took advantage of it. Uh, but there is that, that push to get fans in the door sooner. Uh, obviously, you want to do more with concessions and selling those. However... Fans that we've talked to, one of their options is, they say, like, San Pedro Square Market. Well, there's two things. First off, wide variety of food and beverage, yep. which clearly the Shark Tank has done this push for. Personally, enjoy the uh, variety of beers that have been added. Good. But one of the other options that they talk about is that, well, I can park for much cheaper further away from the tank and have food. Have you guys thought about considering and i know the process of it would be extraordinarily difficult but the idea of offering like say 15 dollar parking before 6 30 or before the doors open but then it's that idea of you're going to have a stream of cars that are uh, laying on the like, horn at right. 629 going hurry up so uh, i don't know or maybe for a particular like uh, a week, weekday games or something like the tuesday or you see like with the oakland days i know they do certain things where the parking is really low for that particular game or something like that just as a or, or trying it out as a uh, as an experiment to see if that does impact and get fans in the seats quicker as jonathan said the uh the happy hour experiment was positive but not as positive as we had hoped so we'll take the findings and we'll look at other avenues. It could be a, a, a reduced parking rate. We don't know. Last year we experimented for one or two games with a uh, discount on uh, merchandise in the, in the Shark Store if it came before, what, 645 for a couple of games last year. So we're going to play oh. with different things. The parking one is an interesting one. Uh, but, yeah, you have to worry about what happens at 629 versus 630 and your watch is early to mine and all that other stuff. Uh, but uh, the ideas will keep coming. And again, the goal here is, in this case, we were using the, the happy hours as a, means, as a means to an end. We wanted to, to help change fan behavior, give an incentive for fans to arrive earlier, uh, and we're still focused on that. And the goal isn't to take away from neighboring watering holes, oh, right? No, right, no, but no. to give people options, right? Mm -hmm. So right. if you want to stay at your neighboring well, that's great, but you want the option to choose what's best for you as a fan. And like you said, especially with the inclement the weather, weather, right? that's a huge We had a game here last night or tonight, Nobody would want to be doing that long walk. Yeah. It was right, so we want to give them a reason to be here. Then it's safer. Always good to have options. Yep. Um, with that, with bringing in more food and beverage purchasing, and, and the same with buying like a ton of stuff like me and AJ do at the shark store. I think we personally like pay for their paychecks. Thank you uh, for that. You're, you're welcome. <laughs> uh, will fans be able to use their phones in in the near future for food, beverage? Yeah, so the, the answer is that's something we're investigating and would like to do, which is more digital payments everywhere in the building. It may be, and uh, for those who go, go back and listen to this thing, I just use the word may be, that the right answer is to use the Shark app as a universal wallet rather than the traditional, maybe more popular digital cash systems that might exist in Silicon Valley. Because, of course, there are many different vendors in the building as well. The merchandise vendor is different than the food and beverage vendor, which is different than the ticket vendor, et cetera. So we need sort of a, a middle ground, somebody that knows how to get access to all those different systems. And in my own personal nirvana, we don't have a way of figuring this out just yet, which is you, you ought to be able to, if you have excess money in your ticket account, you could use that for your for merchandise. Or if you got a refund in your merchandise account, maybe we'd figure out a way to use that for food and beverage. That requires talking to lots of different vendors and getting a universal cash system. We don't have that figured out, but that is something that we want to do. And my guess is it'll be enabled through the Sharks app over time. We've only scratched the surface with the Sharks app. Two years ago, we launched the 4-in-1 app. 
we've added enhancements to it. I think the next enhancement you may see is the is a link to to, to the My Teams NBC uh, Sports in California, so you can watch the live games through the app type of thing. So so those those are all things that we're expanding. But but the app needs to be the base and the foundation from which everything else springs springs forth. With ticketing, we've seen some new options released some new things happening uh, a new three-year commitment option and i'm assuming that's so you can lock in your price for at that point in case there is a rate increase two years later or something you're locked in for that price is there are there any other benefits besides that oh for sure with the, with the so, three years so actually the lock in the price i would say is the second bet I, some people may think of it as the first benefit but it actually started with a very simple observation that actually several fans said to me, which uh, and they said, come on, you know we're going to renew every year, and yet every January and February you pester me with these emails and these phone calls, please renew. And I say, I've already renewed for 10 years or 15 years or 20 years. I'm going to keep renewing until, let's just say, something happens, right? Something. Wh- why do you keep renewing me? Well, because if you don't renew by a certain deadline, I don't know that you're really going to come back, and therefore I want to be able to sell that seat to somebody else that might show up. And so a lot of fans said to us, well, how do I just tell you, yeah, yeah, I'm going to renew, et cetera. Well, I mean, we could do some lifetime thing, but that sounds like a bit over the top. So the first answer that's a, was... That's a heavy commitment, man. <laughs> let's not do that. Let's, <laughs> let's take a model from even the car industry, like a three-year lease, and say, if you know you're going to... I mean, because who can predict what happens? In, I mean, three years is tough, but five years or seven years, it's really hard for us to know what's going to happen then. So let's just say, I sign up for three years. And by signing up for three years, you're guaranteed your seat as well. And you don't have to be pestered every January and February. And I do know we send out a lot of emails and send a lot of phone calls in those. And therefore, you're locked in. You got your seat. You don't have to remember. It's just an auto happened as well. As another benefit, which is the one you mentioned, uh, prices in Silicon Valley, fortunately or unfortunately, depending on your perspective, go up, right? The cost of living. So we'll just, we'll lock in your price at whatever the price is now. And you know that's the payment. In the same way, again, as a car lease, right? For three yeah. years, you got, in fact, you can even pay monthly like you do in a car lease as well. Because sometimes fans say to me, well, if I'm locked into three years, do I have to give you three years of money right now? And the answer is definitely not. No. I mean, if you want to, of course, you can. But you certainly don't need to. And we don't expect Burning a hole in your pocket. <laughs> <laughs> we don't expect you to do that. But, you know, it's a, it's a pay-as-you-go kind of thing as well. Um, it turns out that by then you get, if you decide to take the three-year option and, and you don't have to, um, you can still do the way we've always done it, which is one year at a time. And I, we will pester you every January and February to remind you that you want to renew as a kind of incentive because it's better for you, but it, frankly, it's better for us because we don't want to pester you any more than you want to be pestered. Then we'll give you one of three additional benefits beyond the benefits that you already get for being a Sharks 365 season ticket member. And there are a whole bunch of benefits there. I'm not going to try to go through those. Those are well documented, or you can go on the website. You can choose $100, food and, $100 per year food and beverage credit. So for all that great food that's in the building, you can actually get $100 extra dollars loaded on your card. So if you've already got some kind of food and beverage credit for where you sit in the building or for some other reason, this is an extra $100 per year. So that's $300 for the three years. You can get a $100 merchandise credit to go against the baubles that are not the full arena giveaway. So uh, season ticket holders have said, well, sometimes there's special promo packs, and I want to get access to those, but I don't know how to get access to those. And so we're going to say, here's $100 that you can use to get access to those things as they come out. And no, I don't know what next year's promos and bobbleheads are going to be right now. (laughs) If that's what you're about to ask me, we have not made that decision what next year's are. I think we have an AJ bobblehead. (laughs) Yeah. I think he took you seriously based you? on that. <laughs> <laughs> the biggest head ever. So again, that's $100 a year for the three years. So that's also a $300 credit. Or you can have a one time for the three years, which is roughly a $300 credit for a customized uh, jersey. So oh, nice. It would be like a one-time Sharky visit on your birthday. <laughs> no. So, so those three things are all roughly $300. And... We get it that people's needs change. So if you say in year one, you decided you want the F&B credit, you want the food and beverage, and in year two, you go, ah, I shouldn't have chosen the F&B. I'd rather have the bobble, the merchandise one. We'll switch you. The only time we won't switch you is if you say in year one, you want the jersey, and then you go, oh, now I want to switch to the food and beverage. I'm like, no, that was a one time per the three. You can't. So gotcha. if you're going to pick the jersey, you're done. But if you pick the other two, and you, we'll let you switch back and forth. Gotcha. That makes total sense. Um Another new 
incentive I've seen with the season ticket holders is the top of the tank option. Can yep. you provide more details on yes. on that one? Because it sounds like a great deal for another feedback that came from fans. So again, to the point that we're listening, which is some people have said to us, look, we, we understand the Sharks 365 membership. We, we get that there's a lot of benefits for being part of that guaranteed same seat, get to go invited to these events, etc. I don't want that. I'm a hockey fan. I don't care about all the extra stuff that you guys do on this membership. I just want to be in this building and watch as many games as the Sharks as I can. I see somebody pointing at themselves. I'm not going to call them out on the Paul get podcast made do that. So can you get rid of all that stuff for me? So that's where this top of the tank season passes. It's not a Sharks 365 season ticket. It's a special discounted seat, which is $880 per season, which means $20 per seat. And for those of you that track our prices pretty carefully, and I know there's a lot of out, out there because you hit me up on social media, that's significantly less than the least expensive seat in the building right now, which is typically about 32 bucks. So it's, and it's in, the reason it's called top of the tank is you're not actually on the roof. That's a question that somebody actually uh, asked me before. I was going to go grab a visual aid, but I guess visual aids don't work very well in podcasts, do they? Somebody solved that problem, and we'd be in a really good shape where visual aids work in a podcast. You got an idea how you actually do that? We'll, uh, we'll bring in the webcams next time. Uh, yeah, we can bring in a cam next time. So I'm going to show you my, guys. My, because let me ask this while while he, uh, I'll vamp while he uh, goes. So it's in sections. 226 and 218, if you see where those actually are. Nobody can hear you right now. Uh, nobody can hear me. <laughs> nobody can see me. No, so. 226, 218. Now, this is the upper three rows, upper two rows. Three. Upper three rows. Uh, now, early you, you use a key phrase or a key word that, that I'm latching onto. You, rather than like season ticket, you said like season pass. pass. Correct. Is this a case with top of the tank? Is it? that your seat could be different every time that it's just, that it's always going to be in those top three rows, but you're not sure. Or that, will that's you That's an idea we played with, but not your seat could change from year to year, ah, but from okay. game to game, it's guaranteed. You're also going to get a pass. And by that, I mean a physical card. You're not going to have digital ticketing. You're not going to have transfer. There's no way to resale. It's your pass. Mm -hmm. So it's not a season ticket. So it's for you. Now, of course, if you give the, your pass to a buddy, then your buddy, because it's the pass that does it well. Mm -hmm. But that's what I'm saying. You have a physical seat that you sit in. I haven't gone to check to myself to see if they've all been replaced in their cushiony. Yet. So <laughs> I, back to your question, Master. I don't know that answer if you're about to ask me that question. No, but, I... but you're not guaranteed to have that same seat the following year. Mm -hmm. In fact, to be quite transparent, top of the tank is a experiment. If fans tell us, yeah, we don't really like this, and we don't sell very many of them. I think the opposite will happen, but it, then we won't necessarily do it for the next season as well. Um, also, we have limited number of these seats right now. There are only 300 of them. Mm -hmm. So to the extent that, and I guess if it's wildly popular, we could think about expanding it for next season. But just because we've sold already a lot of season tickets around there, we actually only reserve 300 for this year. Once we've sold the 300 of them, they're gone. We don't have any more that we can issue. Well, and you're talking 20 bucks a game. Yeah, that's which pretty inexpensive. Pretty inexpensive. And you consider that it is top of the tank. tank. Uh, you know, maybe you replace your gym membership with it because you're going to get your steps yeah. in if you're at the top of the tank. Now, you know? <laughs> I don't know about you. I, I've sat at the top of the equivalent venue in many places. Uh, the view uh, from SAP Center top of the tank is probably better than any other venue I've been in anywhere in the U.S. I mean, if you're top of the venue in football, you have a hard time seeing what's happening on the field. If you're top in some of the other NHL arenas, you're a lot further from the ice. Because of the design of our building, our top of the tank seats are actually below our penthouse suites. So in a weird way, you're actually, for 20 bucks, paying less than, I guess, I hope none of our penthouse suites are listening. <laughs> you're, actually doing, you're, you're actually getting a pretty nice seat. Yeah. Um it's funny. One of the one of uh, our friends uh, on the show, uh, yeah. one of the uh, Rocket. She, I brought this up to her, and she said that is the perfect ticket for me. She's like, I don't. I'm not a bobblehead person. Yeah. I don't care for a lot of the ancillary stuff like that. She's our I, target audience. Yeah, I just want to go to the game and go to as many as possible. Yep. So yeah, this. I, I when I saw this, I'm like, that's a really inventive option. Like I think other teams might take a look at that and go, hmm, you know, especially. When you're in a market that has a college so close, like exactly. that can be a great option for entertainment. For and, sure. 
especially when you consider like how much movies are at this point, you know, to go to a theater and it's like, well, this is even more, you know, most movies are over 90 to a hundred minutes. Yep. You're still going to be going for a little while here. Um, Plus you always get, you know, there's overtime. That's the free hockey. Right. And then, Oh, and then they go to the shootout. Everybody has to pay an extra five bucks on the way out. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> the thing that we want to move on to now, and this is uh now we're going to start, Probably uh, poking you w- with the with the devices here. This is uh, this is. Uh, <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank this, you. I like how, how Mr. Becker hands the mic over to Mr. Tutor in that sense. Now th- <laughs> this is so. This is my. This is a personal thing for me. But when I speak with other fans, they all have kind of the same outlook on this, and the same opinion is. How quickly can the Sharks get out of this deal with the Fanatics and running the store? Because I understand Fanatics has been running merch ops for the last couple of seasons. Uh, From a fan perspective, I can tell you I've noticed the overall selection has gone down significantly. The quality of the merch and like the shirts seem thinner. They're not, you know, they don't feel like the heavy quality that they used to be. I don't know what the general fan reaction has been since you've farmed it out to the, to the fanatics. For me, I'm wondering, is it a case of uh, it's just it's easier to farm it out? That way you don't have to have a design team to come up with new merch ideas. Or you'd obviously have to pay designers. You'd have to hire somebody to do the ordering and maintain the store versus just saying, okay, here's... 135 square feet uh, that we know that we can just lease to fanatics for 120,000 a month or something. And we know that that's guaranteed revenue every month and we don't have to worry about it. Whereas before there were really cool items that you, that were very specific that you could only get here. Whereas now it seems like 80%, 90% of the stuff that's in the store, you can just go to a website and get it. And it kind of loses that, you know, that, that personalization or that it, I'll tell you this, I came to the store prior to the fanatics thing. I'd come into the store, even like, you know, when it's not game day, just to come and check out, like, did they get anything new? And I find myself not doing that anymore because you see everything online. And like I said, the selection just seems to have gone down a lot. So uh, good question. Good question. Uh, Fanatics is an excellent partner. Uh, they have been a league partner for a number of years. Uh, they have a handful of NHL clubs as well. And uh, we started with them going into the 16-17 season. They were making a, a big push to be in the Bay Area. Uh, they have the rights to the Niners, uh, to the Oakland A's, to the Earthquakes, and there may be a few more they, they may be landing. Uh, so they're going to be a player here, and the league relationship was, was part of it. Uh, we had done a very good job self-operating. Uh, the store and the merchandise, but we figured, I figure it was my decision to uh, to take a leap with Fanatics as a league partner. They're going to be in the business for a long period of time and uh, and to see where we could go with it. Uh, that being said, there have been some ups and downs uh, with them, as there are with any third-party vendor. We have our ups and downs with our mark as our food vendor, right? And uh, so those, those things are going to happen. Um, we are smoothing them out. We have an excellent new manager of the store, Ian Meek, uh, who Fanatics hired uh, prior to the start of this season uh, that has helped uh, revitalize the store to some degree. Um, we also have been working with Fanatics to be able to uh, turn around more quickly these unique items, uh, particularly during the playoffs. We had a few items last year, the go duck hunting socks, right? Is that, is that <laughs> the key one? Where it's a hot market, uh, fans will be willing to buy it, Fanatics has an upside there. We have an upside there. But we need to get the product into the store more quickly or online more quickly. And we're working with Fanatics to go through, to go through those issues. They've been a really strong, excellent partner. They're excellent at the league level. They're strong at the team level. Uh, but, yeah, as with any relationship, there are some things that are good, some things that need to be improved. And yeah. Fanatics is committed to improving it. And uh, I think you've seen that with, um, with Ian coming on board. The only thing I would add is um, starting this year, we're more involved in the merchandising and the ideas. And so uh, I don't know if you, how much you know about the apparel industry. Unfortunately, they're very long lead times. So as we get more involved in the creative, it's still probably six or nine months before you see some of those items start reaching shelves. 
So I, my own hope is it will end up with the best of both worlds. Operational supply chain there, worldwide footprint, will help keep costs down and, and make things happen more quickly than if we self-operate. But the local flair, they, I mean, no national thing is ever going to do that. We're going to have more of our knowledge about what would work locally infused in that process. And I, it'll take a while to get that to work, but that's where we're trying to head. Okay. I will say the one thing that is like kind of had me perplexed is why is it that I can only get a Burns all-star jersey? Like why aren't they carrying Carlson and Pavelski? And what happens if, say, Pavelski or Carlson has a hat trick in the all-star game and there's no jerseys in there to be purchased? Like that just seems like, well, there's a whole huge revenue stream that just went out the door. So I look forward to what you guys can do with Fanatics. Uh, I'm rooting for you. <laughs> Thanks. They, they've also spent some money on the, on the store itself. Uh, the store flows a lot better uh, than it had previously. So that's been, been a, uh, a plus as well because they're, they're more retailers, right? Uh, so, but yeah, but there are things we need, we need to improve there. As a big collector of Sharks items, pucks, I mean, my nickname is Puck Guy. Whatever happened, you're right. Um, what happened to selling like the warm up pucks? I, I know that there's like game use pucks um, during the game, but that had like the special Sharks versus Canucks, the date on it. It seemed like a really good collector's item uh, because I, we see other teams still doing that. Is that uh, is there a reason that went away, and is there a possibility it could come back? I believe I'll have to double check. I thought we still do sell them. Mm-hmm. It was. I think we, it started during the. 20- we have the foundation pucks are still done. No, 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 That's no. Not- the the twenty fifth. I think it was the 2015-2016 season. It used to be because I have a bunch of them where it has the date, the logo of each right, team, right. and they're used in warmups, and then they put them all into a, like a crate, and then they'd take them to the store, and you could buy them like twenty bucks. I think they're just sold online now. Well, I've never seen one for the sharks. Let's let's look into that. Oh, okay. uh, th- if they're stopped, I don't think it was a fanatics decision, but my mem- my memory's uh, fading me on this one. Okay, no problem. Because uh, I we've already seen. I think on eBay they actually have uh, what is it? The it was kind of cool because it's the Calgary and Sharks logo since they played on New Year's Eve, and it even has a little firework with the date. And I'm like, okay, cute idea for a warm up puck that it's really significant for that. Obviously, each one having the date. Finally, with this. Uh, with the transition to Fanatics, it's, uh, I've kind of noticed there used to be a, a promotion that the Sharks would do called the Save of the Game where there would be some piece of merch that would be nope. discounted. It's still happening? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I just, uh, maybe I'm not hearing the promotion or something. I used to. Uh, I actually was, was with my dad at the last, uh, last game um, yeah, yeah, against Ottawa, and I remember <laughs> yeah. we, we specifically looked up the video board where we had to save the game up there. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, B- by the way, um, we have a couple of. Hmm, uh, forgive me for those of you out there that don't want me to pre-announce this. So, uh, leak it, leak it. <laughs> we have some new interesting ideas with fanatics coming soon. Um, starting in early February, we're gonna roll out uh, something like. Uh, you ever heard of an Amazon locker? So we'll have oh, a okay. fanatics locker. Buy online, pick up in venue. Um, it'll be mm. a test because um, it's the first time we anyone's ever done that with fanatics before. But more details coming soon. So those kind of experiments are starting to happen. Very nice. Uh, that'd be cool. And so you just got an exclusive, just so right, you know. All right. I like it. Breaking news. No. Well, uh, it's not even breaking news because well, the news won't break till February. So. Ah. so I don't know when this podcast goes live, but I'm guessing it's not February. Not five hours. <laughs> <laughs> uh, moving away from the Shark Tank itself, but to Sharks Ice as a... Uh, Oh. Solar, uh, solar for America, for America ice. ice. Sorry, sorry. Unless, of course, you were talking about some of the other sharks' ice. Uh, maybe like the like one in Oakland Center. or Freeman Oakland Ice Center. Yeah, I, I, that's where I played junior hockey for years. So, but we saw many upgrades to Solar for America ice in San Jose. You know, new ice sheets, uh, the original two sheets that were there, along with a new store. Will there be more, or and are there renovation plans for Fremont in Oakland? Um, you can just say yes. And be <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Moving on. Uh, we uh, the demand for ice time in this marketplace for hockey, figure skating, even curling uh, far exceeds the supply, and uh, we're very in, in tune to that. So we want to increase the supply. We uh, on a short term basis, we have made some improvements to Soul for America Ice. We had redone the two 
uh, ice systems for, I think, the center rink and the north rink going into this year. Uh, that was a project that uh, cost some money uh, but was overdue to be needed to improve the ice experience. Much like the lighting here at SAP Center, we improved the lighting, I think, on three of the four sheets of ice at Solar for America over the last three months, again, to improve the quality of the experience for the customer. Uh, we want to build two more sheets of ice on the on the property, and we are working with the city of San Jose to do that. Uh, the city of San Jose owns the property and the and the building. We manage it, much like the relationship here. And we have, um, when we expanded from two sheets to three, then three to four, uh, we had a model with the city that worked to, to get those expansions done. We're trying to replicate that model to get two more sheets built, uh, one of which could be a potential home for the Barracuda. Uh, but uh, we're still many years away from that. Uh, it takes a long time to, to build something of this magnitude in a, in a public-private partnership. Uh, but that's kind of the plan, to build more ice rinks there. We think if we have two more built, they're at 85% they're at capacity within one month after, after opening. Uh, so that's the uh, that's the goal. We're in a good situation in in Oakland. Uh, we renewed our deal with the city of Oakland within the last year, and uh, that's a very vibrant skating community as well. And uh, and same as Fremont. Uh, ideally, Fremont would have more than one sheet of ice uh, than it, than it does. But uh, overall, to control seven sheets of ice for recreational purposes and really an eighth, because sometimes our skaters use SAP Center, uh, mm -hmm. is is really a way to uh, to create the vertical plan uh, for our fans, get people skating and experiencing the sport at a young age, and then when they're ready to uh, to become uh, season ticket holders or buy jerseys or whatever the, take the case is, they they already know what the sport's all about. Uh, and it's worked very well for us over the last 25 years. Very well said, John. The only thing I would add is as the Bay Area has moved more south, Yep. Um, we're probably even more under ice sheeted, if that's even a real word, <laughs> in, <laughs> in, in South County. And so we'd love either through our efforts or cooperation with somebody else through one of the cities, we'd love to see sheets of ice south of San Jose. I won't pick a city because I don't know where they'll end up, but I think the sport deserves stuff down there as well. All about growing the game for sure. Correct. So. Yeah, and what, what, what we have to remember is that the, the cost of land acquisition in California, the cost of, if necessary, environmental cleanup when you buy land, the cost of building labor costs in California, and then the cost of just operating an ice rink is, is, is all very expensive and makes doing these things somewhat, um, the, the, those are obstacles uh, that, that we have to make sure we, we get right in order for the business to work in order for us to provide the right experience. Finally, to finish up, as we're approaching All-Star Weekend, uh, any fun All-Star details you can let us know about? And, and more importantly, how much trouble will Sharky get into? Well, we're really concerned about Sharky and, and, <laughs> and, and Grizzly. Gritty. Uh, gritty, 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 gritty. That's right, gritty. <laughs> uh, the mascot hockey competition is one for, will be one for the ages this year. Right, uh, yeah. So uh, that's that's that is a concern going into the weekend. Um, <laughs> the All Star Game is about the fans, and uh, I, I say I've been here since 2011. Uh, on average, once a week, a fan would come up to me and say, "When are we getting the game back? When are we getting the game back? When are we getting the game back?" I was there in '97. Owen Nolan's called shot. We did the bob bobblehead two weeks ago uh, for the Tampa game with Owen Nolan's call shot. Uh, so the fans wanted the game back, and we were fortunate enough to uh, to bid for the game and to land it. Uh, this year and uh, you know the fact that we have uh, delivered really three high-level marquee events over the last five years the stadium game the Stanley Cup final and now the all-star game uh, is really all for for the fans and to achieve our goal of winning the Stanley Cup and uh, that's what the weekend's about so I ask our fans to celebrate and enjoy it get to fanfare get to the game if you can uh, but just enjoy what the Bay Area has become from a from a hockey standpoint. I'll add just a couple things. For those that have not seen the last 24 hours, we've announced a number of auxiliary events. The Stanley Cup is coming to the city of San Jose's uh, rotunda, basically City Hall. So in a free public event, roughly from noon to 2 as well. Uh, on Friday, that's right. Uh, no, the Thursday, 22nd. The 22nd, right. thank you. 
Thank you for correcting me, AJ. <laughs> Tuesday, 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 twenty second. Jeez, my brain doesn't work. Thank you, guys. <laughs> also, we announced uh, part of the headline entertainment. BB Rexa is going to be there as well. Um, so there are a whole auxiliary things. Come to our own website if you want to see a listing with things as well. I know a lot of people are putting together their own sort of parties around this as well. This is really a chance to celebrate hockey and the Bay Area. So the number of side activities almost outnumbers the <laughs> formal activities as well. But uh, uh, there will be a lot of uh, fans of other clubs who show up in uh, the Bay Area to come see the All-Star Game. Let's show them how special San Jose Shark fans are when they're here. Well, and this is going to be like one of the first times that the All-Star Game has been played like on a Saturday in prime time in like forever. I always remember it being like a Sunday first afternoon time, thing that's it? always taken place like that week in between uh, football championships and then the Super Bowl. Uh, yes, it's, it's usually a Saturday-Sunday uh, routine. I think uh, being on the West Coast and the way the TV windows work in the Eastern time zone, remember 80% of the country lives in the Central time zone or the Eastern time zone, right? So uh, there was a, a thought. <laughs> Not that you could tell from living in the Bay Area, but go on. <laughs> a thought, a thought to, to adjust the schedule to, to, to accommodate that to some degree. Uh, the league has done Friday, Saturday before. Uh, this just shows my, my length of time working in the sport. Uh, in 2002, coming after 2000, the 9-11 in 2001, the NFL had to move their Super Bowl around, and mm. that, that impacted the All-Star Game. I think the Super Bowl ended up on the same weekend as the All-Star Game. So the All-Star Game then moved to a Friday, Saturday, not to compete with the Super Bowl on a Saturday, Sunday. And then, uh, this is way more detail than you need to know, in 2007, the league experimented with uh, going All-Star Game midweek in Dallas. Uh, I think it was a Tuesday night, Tuesday, Wednesday scenario. Uh, but uh, either way, it's going to be a fun, fun weekend, and we're, we're very excited for the uh, ability to deliver significant economic impact to the city of San Jose. Uh, the weekend alone will we'll use 7,500 hotel rooms. The league brings in a lot of its uh, partners, its vendors, its guests, other team executives coming in. I think all the major hotels in downtown are being used. Every event associated with All Star will be in San Jose, in the downtown, and in many cases in walking distance from each other. Uh, whether it's the fanfare at the convention center, the games itself, stuff happening on Cesar Chavez Plaza, so forth and so on. So we're very happy about that economic impact. And in our 25, 25th year uh, of the of the SAP Center, the, to be able to to celebrate having a being a part of the college football playoff with the media day here on January 5th to have the All-Star game, All-Star weekend follow that three weeks later. And then in two months from now, in, in March, we have the first two rounds of the NCAA basketball tournament. We are very proud of uh, our ability uh, with the SAP Center to deliver significant marquee events to put San Jose on the international sports map while delivering significant economic impact dollars to, to our downtown. And uh, that's just a, a credit to uh, to the way our fans respond to these events, that these, these, uh, these national governing bodies still want to keep coming back year over year. And I look forward to uh, June when we're hosting the f cup final again. <laughs> That's the goal. <laughs> you know we're superstitious. We're not going to say anything. <laughs> oh, good. Well, thank you guys for joining us, and uh, thanks for all the all the info. Thanks for having us on again. Thanks for tuning in to another cast from Teal Town USA. Remember to follow us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Teal Town USA. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and find us on the web at tealtownusa.com.